Alright guys, how's it going? It's been a bit longer than I anticipated since my last video. I've had a bit of a rough month in fact, developing hay fever for the first time in my life, aged 47. But leaked tech information only stays hidden so long. <laughs> so enough of my whining and let's get on with it. Right, so MI300, AMD's AI Instinct Accelerator, and their next generation super chip. We first caught wind of this a couple of years ago, and the interesting part was that some of the early rumours suggested it might be an APU, which is of course a CPU and GPU combined into one piece of silicon, by the classic definition, and I confirmed this seven months later in a video showing an internal AMD slide, which I published back in May last year. And today I have some more information about the MI300 family of products. Just to be clear though, I wouldn't say MI300A, that's the one with the CPU and the GPU combined. I wouldn't actually call that an APU because an APU by the usual definition is CPU and GPU on a single slab of silicon. However, we learned some time ago that in fact MI300 would be a series of separate CPU and GPU chiplets stacked on interposers. Now, YouTuber High Yield has a good video on it, and they also made up this slide detailing each of the parts. So we see AMD MI300 A, the yellow part around the edge here. This is the package substrate, on top of which are the interposers which we can't really see because stacked on top of the interposers are first of all a layer of four 6 nanometer cache chiplets, which we can't actually see either because on top of those are the chiplets we can see, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 graphics chiplets, the 6 graphics core dies in green, and 3 chiplets worth which is 24 cores of Zen 5 at the bottom right here in red, and down either side are the stacks of HBM3. So yeah, that's called a SOC, not an APU. Now, AMD themselves have been giving out small details back and forth, most notably back at CES in January. And that's when we first learned about the massive transistor count of 146 billion transistors. Even Intel's huge Ponte Vecchio had around 100 billion transistors. And Nvidia's A100, had 54 billion transistors, that's back in 2020 though. But even their upcoming hopper H100 has only 80 billion transistors. But it's important to know of course that hopper is a GPU, not an APU. It is a single very large 814 square millimeter GPU. Now AMD's next slide of note on MI300 was this. Their claimed performance uplift over their own MI250X. And if you've learned anything on this channel over the years, it's that you should never take marketing slides seriously. Especially when you see an outlandish claim like 2x or 3x faster, or in this case, 8x, the AI performance. And so this will lead on nicely to how AMD has achieved this massive performance gain. If we look at the MI250X specifications, part of that answer should become pretty apparent. Obviously, GPUs are pretty good at crunching numbers, and these compute units, 220 of which comprise MI250X, they can work on different types of numbers, including 64-bit floating point, which is known as double precision, all the way down to 4-bit integer operations. Now, the higher the number, the better or more precise the numbers are. However, crunching large numbers with multiple decimal places usually comes with a performance penalty. That's the trade-off for the precision. There's very little need for FP64 double precision when training AI models. They just don't need that level of precision. FP64 is mostly reserved for high performance computing use cases, like studying star and galaxy formation, the weather patterns, and that kind of pioneering science. FP32 single precision is what we see used most often in games. This is also the gold standard for training AI models, and most AI neural networks are represented in FP32. However, 
even FP32's precision is unneeded in most cases. And so if you drop to FP16 half precision, that can help to save half of the memory storage and bandwidth of FP32. But it does unfortunately lead to one or two unwanted issues. So a new format called BFloat16 was devised, which solved all of those issues with FP16 half precision, while still maintaining the improvement on the memory load. Looking at MI250X, we can see that peak single precision FP32 performance is 48 teraflops, while FP16 and BFloat16 are 383 teraflops. So simply put, if your model can run at 16 bit instead of 32 bit, you're gaining nearly an 8 times speed up. But that's for training AI models. When it comes to AI inference, which is essentially processing the input and output between the user and the AI, even FP16 is generally unneeded. And in fact, even floating point is barely used. Since NVIDIA launched their Tesla accelerator based on Pascal, which introduced int8. That is to say, 8-bit integer operations on the GPU. And CPUs are just as good in most cases. And that's basically where they come into the AI story. But all of this stuff's for another video. The point of this is that in many cases, just as FP16 and BFloat16 is good enough for training many AI models, int4 is good enough for AI inference. And looking again at MI250X, we can see that it performs exactly the same in int8 as it does in int4 at 383 tops. And the reason for this is essentially both the int4 and the int8 are using the exact same hardware within the graphics chip. NVIDIA's Turing first brought int4 to the GPU. And we can see the kind of speed up that brought over int8. And it's taken a while for AMD to get there. Where have we heard that before? But by now, it should be pretty obvious that a large portion of this 8x AI performance speed up claimed for MI300 over MI250X. That is basically down to AMD finally achieving parity and having int4 specific pathways in their compute units. But with that said, we still only need to multiply this 383 tops by 8 to get a number north of 3000 tops. Now, in 8 is going to get nowhere near that rate. And if you're hoping to see more than twice the FP32 performance, or even twice the FP16 performance in MI300, I don't think so. That brings me around nicely to the next part of the video and the first new leak. Because I can now exclusively reveal the compute unit count of MI300A. Remember, MI250X had 220 CDNA2 compute units. Well, MI300A has 228. Yes, 8 more. A whole 8 more compute units. And that is undoubtedly a hell of a lot less than what most people were anticipating. We saw what happened with RDNA3 and its new compute unit layout over RDNA2. Or, if you didn't see that, feel free to watch my videos on it. Clearly, CDNA3 will also have changes in the compute unit. But we simply don't know what kind of changes yet. It is likely that we'll see the same dual issue that we saw with RDNA3. Whether or not MI300 has similar issues, that is still anyone's guess. And clearly, as I just alluded to, there will obviously be int4 specific pathways as well. And so really, as disappointing as the 228 compute unit count looks, it doesn't actually tell as much except how many compute units MI300A has. And that number is 228. 228 divided by 6 is 38. So each graphics chiplet 
has 38 compute units, which means we're looking at a cut down chiplet here, with the full chiplet presumably having 40 compute units. If that is the case, it's pretty interesting as one would imagine that these graphics chiplets are pretty small. Navi 31, that was what, about 300 square millimetres? And that was for 96 compute units. So we already know the MI300 chiplets. Let's see, 40 divided by 96, and then multiply that by 300. These chiplets must be a maximum of 125 square millimetres, and they should probably be smaller than that, in fact. We know that both Navi31 and the MI300 graphics chiplets, most of the cache that used to be on the die, that is now on a separate cache die. However, there is still quite a bit of extra I.O. on Navi31 as well. And you wouldn't have one of those on each of those chiplets. That's just a waste of die space. So I would say that each MI300 chiplet probably comes in... I mean, you could be talking 100 square millimetres or maybe as much as 110 square millimetres for each 40 compute unit chiplet. And that is an educated guess you could call it. I don't think it'll be that far away though. Now remember, NVIDIA's upcoming H100 with its 80 billion transistors is 814 square millimetres, around 8 times larger than a single MI300 graphics chiplet. So let's just dig out the silicon cost calculator and work that one out. 814 and we'll stick with a 90% yield and the wafer price, or let's just call it 17,000 again. So NVIDIA will get 63 H100s on every wafer, costing 300 bucks a piece. Now as I said, let's go with 110 for the MI300 graphics chiplet. That is 579 at a cost of under 33 bucks. Now, of course, you do need six of these on each package. So just divide this 579 by six, and that gives us 96 complete packages per wafer. Now what was NVIDIA again? 63, so you're getting about 50% more per wafer compared to NVIDIA. And if you multiply that by six, you get to about 190 versus 300. But on top of that, you have to remember there's 24 Zen 5 cores, and there's also the cache and I.O. dies underneath. And if you add all of that up, plus the extra packaging cost, it should be rather obvious that both H100 and MI300A, that is, likely have similar sort of yield rates and cost, around about the $300 mark each. And... The rumours have it that both of these chips are selling for over $10,000 each. So you can basically already figure that the manufacturing cost here is just utterly meaningless. 300 bucks in a $10,000 plus cost product? That is nothing. And with that, it should also be clear that AMD didn't take the chiplet route with MI300 for monetary reasons. It probably costs a little bit more to manufacture, in fact, if you consider the whole package. So if they didn't go chiplets for money reasons, they can only be doing it for performance reasons. And I got a bit annoyed when I figured that because, obviously, what they're doing with MI300 is what I expected them to do with Navi on the desktop. However, well, just as how they went with Epic chiplets first, Hindsight once again tells us that if AMD really wanted to win, it's AI where they really want to win. Right, so to finish this one off with yet more leaked info, throughout this video you've heard me say and emphasise A when talking about MI300. A. But there is not just one MI300, nor are there just two, but three MI-300s. So, say hello to MI-300X. MI-300X is not an APU, it's a discrete GPU with 304 compute units. 
That is eight graphics chiplets, all connected via an Infinity Fabric mesh. On top of that, it also has the option of up to 192 gigabytes of HBM3. AMD are pulling no punches while declaring this GPU as the fastest GPU for training and inference. And the third MI300, MI300C, is neither a GPU or an APU, it's a CPU, a 96 core Genoa CPU with 128 gigabytes of HBM3. All of this information will be confirmed on June the 13th when AMD hosts an AI and data center event. But what does this all mean? Well, at a hardware level, AMD appears to hold at least three of the ACs. They are much bigger. They have thrown so much more silicon at this than Nvidia has with H100. And that comes down to one thing the real power of chiplets. Nvidia couldn't go any bigger than 814 square millimetres. AMD has packed massively more silicon in the same package simply because chiplets allowed that. And MI300A is an all-in-one package. This thing is insane. It's literally an entire AI machine on one package. The CPU and GPU share the same memory pool, which should be fantastic for power and performance reasons, as well as simplicity in programming, something which they sorely need, to be honest. And MI300A doesn't even need DDR memory. It can run self-contained on the HBM. But NVIDIA, if they've only got one ace, it's the ace of hearts, if you like. Their software is so far ahead that most will want H100 instead, even if it's 30% slower than MI300. But perhaps most telling will be availability. All of the rumours point to a glut in demand and not much availability. And that is the problem when you build these huge monolithic dies. Nvidia saw it coming, of course, they always do. However, they've got a wafer limit at TSMC, so any increase in H100, it's probably going to lead to a decrease in client GPUs, which probably means even higher prices for us, unfortunately. After AMD's poor financial quarter this quarter, the stock nosedived to $81. However, the very next day we started to hear rumours of a collaboration with Microsoft perhaps which set the stock soaring again, well past 100. What that's all about, we don't exactly know yet. However, there are rumours suggesting that at least three of the big four hyperscalers, uh, those being Microsoft, Amazon, Google and Meta, of course, at least three of them are on board with MI300. And as I just recorded this, Nvidia stock has skyrocketed due to Jensen Huang putting a huge $11 billion outlook on Nvidia's next quarter. This is all about AI. AMD have also gained rapidly on Nvidia's news. And if it wasn't obvious before now, it should be obvious to you now. AI will be the biggest thing since the internet, possibly even the biggest thing since the microchip itself and maybe even the biggest thing since electricity. It is a very good time to be holding tech stocks, which as you all know all too well by now, it's a bad time to be a PC gamer. We'll all just bend over and hope for the best that the new world of AI will bring to us. But with this one being 499, that's something that I hope to cover in my 500th video on the channel. Catch you later guys.